Hundreds of people today phoned the ZBC saying they sighted an unidentifying flying object. It was a bright, radiant light. I've never seen anything like it in my life. It was the absence of noise I didn't like. People from all over Zimbabwe were phoning the BBC to say, we've seen something weird. There were three of us that saw it. Myself, the co-pilot, and the pilot in the other aircraft. No wings, no nothing. Shiny over thing. Ariel School, 19th, September, 94. Could you tell me what you saw on Friday? The silver thing in amongst this clump of, of trees. We saw this black figure running. His, his face was like this, and his eyes were down here. I just thought it was some kind of alien from a different planet. When you looked at those children, they were absolutely credible. And, and whereabouts was it? In the trees over there. There was a big group of kids pointing and making a noise and shouting and screaming. The panic spread. Am I safe or am I not safe? If he's a Harvard psychiatrist. Meet Dr. John Mack, a believer in aliens from outer space. We came away convinced that an extraordinary event occurred here. I think they want people to know that we're actually making harm on this world. How did that get communicated to you? It came through my head. Somehow there was a message about pollution from the way he was staring. Yes. Oh, I was just a hard-ass journalist. I could handle war zones, but I could not handle this UFO thing. I mean, I never felt this could derail my career. The dean wanted to know, what is he doing? <laughs> Angels, yes. Extraterrestrials, no. John has lost it this time. This journey is literally to pick up the pieces and put them back together. Oh, my gosh. I was right on the log when it actually happened. We are the ones who drew those funny pictures. Something that I'll never, ever forget. I've drawn this again. That's why I usually kept it quiet. People think you're crazy. My husband doesn't even know about it. You feel so alone in society. Why is it that we tend to want to shrink this powerful phenomenon to our notions of reality rather than being able to stretch ourselves to expand what we know and to admit that we don't know. Would you like to see him again? Yes. And if you saw him again, what would you do? I'll ask him some questions. What would you like to ask him? I'll ask him what is he doing on Earth and what does he want with us? everyone and that was one heck of a trailer for one heck of a movie i'm martin willis and i am reviewing the ariel phenomenon uh, i've been lucky enough to know randall nickerson and he has done such an amazing job on this the original trailer is down below in the text of this video i have said many times on this show over the years that i believe the ariel school incident back in 1994 is the most credible and important ufo encounter um that in my book that there is uh, others may argue there are some other really great ones and interesting ones but this one is what turned my belief into something is really going on um, i'm going to run a few clips today but first of all i want to tell you the screener and this production that I've been able, so lucky to be able to view early, is just amazing. It is a work of art and it is so fascinating all the way through. I hope that everyone out there who's watching this right now can go get this movie and watch it. It is hands down my very favorite uh, movie on this topic. I am friends with Randall Nickerson. He has not paid me a cent to do this. He's given me his blessings though, to run the trailer and to do this video today. So uh, as we go along here, I'm going to put in a couple of clips from people that I have interviewed, direct witnesses. And right now we're going to start with Randall Nickerson himself and Emily Trim. Uh, so while we're speaking with you, uh, Randall, what uh, what actually kicked into gear this uh, this this is a big project, and <laughs> why, what happened? Um, 
Well, I, I, you know, the more I found out, the more I was like, wow, this is, uh, I think it really happened with uh, finding the kids, going to the school, finding it was still there in 08, and then going back again and again, um, but also going all over the world, uh, talking to the, to the, these witnesses. Um, I spent a long time, uh, in the beginning, um, interviewing witnesses that had seen that were not part of the aerial school, but were around the area to sort of get a sense of what they had seen. Um, and again, I was struck by their, you know, um, their, their candor and honesty and um but i think when it was the the kids also motiv- motivated me to carry on uh and also once i started interviewing the reporters that covered the the scene uh i was amazed because they had kept everything that you know had happened during that day they kept all the tapes all their notes wow. cuz they wow. they thought it was really a significant event and um you know, listening to them, uh, the different reporters, that was impressive to uh, to me and motivated me even further. I mean, all along the way, every time I get it, got in a new piece of archival footage from 1994, uh, I was re-motivated. And, uh, um, and, and, you know, the end goal was really to, to just get this uh, story told right, you know, to tell, tell the story as it happened and uh, by the people it happened to. Um, I chose not to narrate because I just felt like it's a much difficult, more difficult path to take as a filmmaker. But it's, uh, I think it's more authentic because it comes from, uh, comes from the people themselves. Yeah, but, but it's coming. It's uh, and and believe me, if there's nobody else more than me myself that wants it to be out into the world, because I, I'm just aware of how how this will affect uh, will affect people. I mean, we've we we. Yeah, and and yes, of course, absolutely, That's right. and, and affect affect the kids, absolutely, and yeah. uh, and to be able to share their story, it's uh, really important, and uh, and absolutely, I feel like this in a, a big way. This to, for me, this is a a gift to the kids that were there, and the people that were there, and the teachers that were there, and the other witnesses that were around there, the pilots that were in the air, to tell the story, like because. And I think that will probably be the most appreciated by the people that were there because of the hard work that got went into it to actually find out what the story was, you know, not, not just, you know, the, the event itself, but what led up to the event and what happened after the event and, and the human impact of, of it, because this is really, this is a, a story about people. It's not about special effects or woo-woo stuff. It's it's uh, it's about something serious that occurred and um, how people dealt with it and have struggled with it and uh, how it changed their lives. Right. Yeah. Well, I wait by my mailbox every day looking for the uh, video. I haven't well, seen you'll, it. Well, it's very <laughs> the soon. The influencer. I promise you that. I promise All you right. that very soon. Yeah. Uh, Emily, um, one thing that you said in your story, I just, I just want to, I mean, it really hit me, even though you said it so uh, matter-of-factly, was you were standing next to two beings. Um, to me, that's like, wow. And I've talked to Sal- Salma about this, and I was just awestruck by what she said. Um, and the telepathic thing that you're talking about, it does make sense. First of all, that uh, school children are are witnessing these. There's been a number of cases um, because of the message to pass to the young ones that are going to carry on in the future. You know, protect the planet. And boy, we see signs of that right now. We we're possibly mm-hmm. in big trouble with what's going on climate wise. Um, can you? Describe. Do you remember? I know you were only in third grade, but can you remember? what the beings look like. Can you describe those, please? Yeah. um, Well, I mean, it is, I was talking to Randall about this yesterday, and I think all of us are going to have a bit of a different depiction, but very similar in their attributes, Mm -hmm. uh, just based on being human. And, you know, I I use the description of, like, uh, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, you know, so we're all going to have kind of slight differences and that makes it real. 
um, they they were kind of reflective in their appearance, so there was a bit of a luminosity to them. Uh, large black eyes, and, like elongated heads, like el- enlarged heads, um, very uh, longer, thinner necks, not too long, but longer, thinner necks. Um, their limbs were more uh, flimsy, almost. And they were they were hovering. They weren't actually touching the ground. Hmm. And I described them with a little bit, a slight of a pot belly. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that means anything, but <laughs> that's that's what they um, looked like. And it was slightly um, like if you were to uh, use an animal as a description. Um, the skin was like uh, a reptile skin, but luminous with like an iridescence to it. Wow. I remember when I spoke to Salma and she said that she thought they almost looked like porcelain in a way. Did you have any of that uh, thought? I mean, now that you look back at it? Well, like they were reflective to me. So there was like, it would be, for me, I would describe it as more light um, because this event happened in the day. Um, so I, when I describe it as more of like a luminosity and, um, an iridescence, uh, it it would be like taking a fabric and creating, um, a different sheen, uh, on the fabric. So their skin Mm -hmm. to me, um, reflected the light. I see. And when, when you got the telepathic message... Um, can you describe what that was like? I mean, it's just really hard to picture how, you know, how something happens telepathically. Yeah, well, you know, I don't know if it, it's difficult these days because we're we're doing things like transferring consciousness into robots. And, you know, we have all these kind of advancements in our technology, um, you know, that it's it's like a neural link. Um, so you, how I describe it is, is the, you're immediately immersed in the connection with the eyes Mm. and it's almost as though the eyes create this neural link, um, with you. And then it was just like seeing a slideshow of images, um, run across your mind like you would in a dream, but um, happening in real time. Wow. Did you talk to other, you know, children around you um, afterwards? I know you said you spoke to your friend, but would you say that they were getting the same messages or just similar messages? I think we all had a similar comprehension. Randall might have a bit more of an understanding on that. Um, I didn't have very much time to spend with the students after um, the event happened. My family and I moved very um, soon after the event. So a lot of the other kids got more of an opportunity to discuss it, whereas because we were missionaries, we had moved back to Canada. And um, so I didn't really have that time spent with the other children to really go over and discuss that. And to be honest, the teachers kind of wanted things to go back to normal. So it was back to work as usual, you know, because our main focus was um, gaining education, right? So they tried to normalize the situation for us as much as possible. Okay. And another thing, um, Over these years, people have asked me over and over again, when is this video coming out? Uh, Well, it's coming out on May 20th. You can pre-order now. And by the way, this is totally worth the wait. Now, Randall put 15 years of his life into this. And you will see when you watch this movie um, why he painstakingly did so. And right now, I'm going to play another clip. This is Francis Cheramuda in Madagascar, and I talked to him. He's one of the witnesses. Lights and how now I have a clear picture of um, there being these spheres. And these spheres were about my size, you know, the size of, uh, of an adult human. 
right? And um, these spheres were kind of rotating around the craft in an anti-clockwise motion. Um, and they were glowing bright, bright white. Yeah. Wow. Um, kind of kind of the way I look at it, um, the light that a lot of people were seeing um, were, were being emitted by these spheres. All right. And mm -hmm. as we kind of progress through the story, um, they kind of switched behavior in a way. And um, as if they were being repelled by a magnet, um, one at a time, the spheres shot off in different directions, right? Then leaving the craft itself, which um, because there was no light now shining on the on the craft, you, you could tell it was a silver sort of color of the craft. And um, yeah, this is the most vivid and direct memory that I actually do recall, you know, from the regression and from past memory as well. By account, there were actually three beings. Um, two of them um, kind of remained um, within the line of sight from the playground to the craft. And um, another one, which is also one of my most vivid memories was um, one of the beings actually darting from the craft um, towards the direction of the swimming pool. Um, the swimming pool, which was probably about two, three, four hundred meters um, to the left of the playground. Um, and the most peculiar thing was um, the way in which it moved, because it almost felt as if um, it would disappear and appear a few meters ahead of itself, you know, almost in a blinking fashion and not um, in the normal linear fashion that you'd expect someone to be moving, you know. Well, and did um, you see it like, did it look like it was floating? I've heard other people say, like it, they never saw it actually touch the ground, its feet. No, in, in this case, like I was saying, um, it would just be the appearing and disappearing. So um, I would just warrant to guess and say, yes, it probably looked like it was floating, but at no point did it ever look like it was physically running, if I could say that. Mm -hmm. All right, so now I wanna leave you uh, with this very last uh, clip of an interview I did with Selma Siddick, a wonderful lady. She lives on the West Coast here in the United States and very articulate. And here is an interview I did with her and Randall Nickerson, and here it is. Um, so we saw something shiny over on these copies, and then it was flashing, you could see it, and then you couldn't see it, or it could have actually been flashing. We couldn't, I, I can't, I still don't know today, but it was incredibly, incredibly bright, um, and very different from anything we had seen before. And then um, my friend who I was standing next to, she and I saw, um, like a being, I guess, and if there were multiple beings, I don't know, but they all looked exactly the same. And did you actually walk toward the object? We did not walk towards the object. We walked toward um, the the barrier of the playground, which is sort of where the being was, but not cross the barrier. We didn't cross the barrier, so it was really a lot of. You know, we were inquisitive. What, what is this? I don't know what this is. And it's sort of, you know, any human being is going to try and rationalize what it is that they're seeing. And as an 11 year old, we couldn't couldn't really put into words what it was we were seeing and, and trying to justify it. And so, you know, it was uh, very in, in like a human esque form, um, but much shorter, um, really big head really big eyes, if it did have a nose, couldn't really see it, but also the, 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 the skin pigmentation was very, very different. It was very odd. It was nothing like I'd ever seen before. Um, and the closest thing that I could um, compare what it was wearing would be something like a scuba diving suit. It was just very form-fitting, very black, um, a little shiny at times um but i don't know if that was just the sun it was a pretty pretty warm day it was a beautiful day every day is beautiful in zimbabwe actually um so it was it was just a very normal day and then this happened um 
was very, very immense, very intense, and clearly has changed my life. So, yeah, in a now, nutshell, that's it. Yeah. Did you did you walk away when this was happening, or did you stay there until it? walked away or turned away or went away yeah no I actually um, I actually broke my eye lock with it um, because I wanted to go and check on my brother and sister who were much younger and playing in a different part of the playground um, because I felt that if I was afraid then they must be terrified too um, but there are a lot of other things that happened during this interlocking moment um, that I go into in in my uh, piece tomorrow uh, but once I let go of my friend's hand and I disconnected from that gaze, which was not an easy thing to do at all, I feel like it took every ounce of, of effort and energy from me and I felt absolutely exhausted afterward. Um, I didn't see it again. Wow. Now all right. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching this clip. And do go down below into the text and you can see where you can order this movie and you don't want to miss this one hands down it's the best film on this topic thank you all for watching would you like to see him again yes and if you saw him again what would you do i'll ask him some questions what would you like to ask him i'll ask him what is he doing on earth and what does he want with us